Hello everybody, this is the one and only Mr. LP, Steven Sykes, and here with Live and Radio, part of Legacy Internet Radio. And as always, we're here bringing about new and great, wonderful people um, that's doing a, part, a lot of great things in the community, locally, nationally, all across the world. And it's all a part of our Empowered Women series. And we have another wonderful, great person for you today. And the, her lovely name is... Dr. Lynette Monte. Dr. Lynette Monte. That's correct. Oh, how do you spell Lynette? Lynette is L-I-N-E-T-T-E. Oh, L-I-N-T-T-E. Okay, yes. not Y. Oh, you wanted, to be, you wanted to be different. You got it. I okay. want to be different. Your, your mom wanted to be different. <laughs> was she high on that morphine? Absolutely. Her <laughs> Funny that you should mention that. She always blames me for being in labor for 36 hours. 36 hours? 36 hours. What month you were born? June. Mm, so she done missed out on a whole bunch of time. <laughs> trying to get a, she trying to get to the beach. <laughs> Probably. Okay, that's not a problem. That's, uh, so, Miss Lynette Monte. Doctor. Doctor. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> You're a doctor in? Training and performance improvement. Training and performance improvement. And where did you get your doctor degree at? At Capella University. Oh, Capella. Oh, where did you get your undergrad at? Ah, my master's degree is in executive leadership. And I obtained that at Liberty University. Uh -huh. And my bachelor's is in psychology, and I attended George Mason University. Ooh, so you done hit it all around and online. Yeah. How did you like going to um, George Mason? Love it. Mm. Awesome school. Uh, awesome school. Awesome school. Fairfax is a lot of fun. I'm loving Little Virginia. Oh, yes. If I had to pick a place, there's a few places now, mm -hmm. but if I had to pick one place to live, it would be Northern Virginia. I have to be in Woodbridge. Although it's getting a little bit crowded, but crowded. Yeah. But I say I like to use it because at least I can get up and down and things like that. You stuck. You get over there. You got loud and county and everybody else trying to come in the same way and stuff like no, that. No, I want to be in Alexandria, somewhere close to the action. Uh, Old Town Alexandria. That works. Okay, that now works. the problem. <laughs> uh, Potomac Yards. You know what? I was going to say, when you said Woodbridge, I was like, are you trying to get close to Dale City? Is that, no, you know, I, you want to go shopping? I, well, well, Potomac Mills is in Woodbridge. So yeah. Right there. You know, I live right down the street from it. Really? Mm -hmm. cool. We have um, Muramusa uh, Plaza area. Okay. So, you going to go shopping next week? Let me see. I have to check my calendar. Okay. I think I'm actually speaking next week. Where at? Who knows? I'm always speaking someplace. I have the best publicist in the world. Oh, so I'm oh. always someplace Who's your speaking. publicist? You haven't heard of her? Her name is Nikki Curry. She's Nikki she's Curry. Awesome. Yeah. Curry as in curry soup or things like that or just curry? Hot, si hot sizzling curry hot soup. Sizzling, <laughs> hot sizzling. Okay. Not a problem. Not a problem. So college was not that time long ago. It was also that you see that you're so money, a lot of money so fast in a few years after college. Well, you know what? Someone has to make some money to pay all that student loan debt back. Uh, oh, see, oh, see. What is your thoughts on the student loan? Oh, boy. You know, here's the thing for me. I really wish mm -hmm. that people who wanted to go to school could attend and not have to take out student loans, not go into debt to get something that I feel is rightfully ours, which is knowledge, which is education. I believe that there needs to be some type of break. I'll give you an example. If you make all A's all throughout your four years high school, you should not have to pay for college. Oh, I if, like that. If you make, if you're on the honor roll all your whole entire college, uh, excuse me, high school, then you get two years of college for free. Nice. Or if you make, if you attend, um, if you never miss a day of school, there's, there's quite a few people that do it every year from like um, elementary on. Mm -hmm. You know, you may not be on all A's, but I figure like this: if you never miss a day of school, chances are you're not a bad kid. Yeah. You should be able to go to school for free. What do you think about Okay, that? so when are you going to run for office so you can put this on your platform? I might be, I have quite a few things. I might be assassinated and <laughs> things like that. I want to, you know, I think we should have a required national and uh, international domestic exchange program. Interesting. Everybody that would spend a, a semester overseas or locally somewhere else in the I U.S. Like well, I really like the idea of school. And, and, you know, I am a business strategist mm -hmm. and a speaker and an author. But I have a passion for youth empowerment as well. I, I happen to be the founder of the international movement to empower more youth. Ah, and then with that includes so much education, empowerment. Well, you know, 
going back to your question about the student loan thing, I think education is critical to young people being successful. And so I love the idea of rewarding them for doing what they are supposed to do in school instead of paying so much attention to the young people who aren't doing See, what they should it, be doing. It should be, and that's where a lot of kids, um, and I will say I felt that pressure, but I could see uh, the angst where a lot of people have, like, I'm busting my tail, and they all have the attention, but then you have to put them in another school, which is fine, and things like that, and, you know, work it out a different way, but there's always the attention I have to go to someone who's cutting up the class, and thus you see a lot more intelligent kids being foolish in class. Yeah. So we're gonna have They're to go going to get that. attention no matter what. It's either good attention or negative attention. But mm -hmm. young people need and crave attention. So it really is important. So when I do run for office, I'm going to have you on my board. Yay. Board. Okay, I'm, I'm ready. ready. Not a problem. I'm ready. How much money do you want? Well, now we have to negotiate that because I'm pretty expensive. Okay. Well, it might be worth it and things like that. How about 150 grand? How, for how often? A year? Yeah. Mm, and how many hours do I have to work? Well, you don't govern me. They don't work at all. <laughs> <laughs> they work like 80 days out of the year. So, okay. okay so we Sounds do. pretty good. All right, Sounds good. Close. Okay, not a problem. <laughs> so, uh, you mentioned you are, excuse me, you are a business uh, strategist. Yes. And you're a business uh, with coaching and a variety of different things. Tell me, what got into that for you? What brought that out? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I think that some people are born entrepreneurs, and I think some people are made entrepreneurs. I happen to be one of those that's born. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes when I'm speaking, I tell my story, or part of my story, which is that I have probably been fired from almost every job I've ever had. You mean on lemonade stand? You know? <laughs> <laughs> And, and really the reason for that is because I have a natural gift for processes and systems and being able to zoom in real quick on what's not working and knowing how to fix it. Mm -hmm. So every time I got a job, that's why they hired me because they had a problem, they wanted me to fix it. But I fixed it too fast, I fixed it too well. And they were, I guess, offended by that. They've had this problem for six, seven, ten years, and after six months, I had everything all organized and fixed. So I realized that clearly I wasn't meant to have a job. So I went back into the entrepreneurial world, and I love it. That's where I belong. That's my space. So it's the place that I need to stay. So you... Now, when you realize that, you know, the nine to five obviously wasn't for you, you could have gone into cooking, you could have gone into... Oh, that's funny. Uh, you, you, you <laughs> why is that funny? Because <laughs> I don't cook. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can't, hold on. Now, I can cook. Oh, okay. I, I can, can cook. cook. Okay. We're going to get, you had a bunch of people screaming, no! Yes, okay. Okay. no. I can cook. Okay. I do not. I choose. You choose not, not to. to cook. You just don't like to cook. I don't really like to cook, but guess what's amazing? What's that? I happen to have a daughter who loves to cook. Oh. And she is really, really good at it. So for years, she fixes everything I eat, and it works. How old is your daughter? You don't look. She's fifteen. You don't look that old, young man. I might oh. see somebody. Okay, I'll show it to you. Okay. So my son is 22. He just had a birthday a couple of days ago. Well, happy early birthday. What's your the son and daughter's name? You got to give a shout out. We don't get uh, it. Well, my son's name is DJ. Hey, DJ. How you doing, man? I'm here with your mom. <laughs> She's safe. We promise. <laughs> and my daughter's name is Danette Michaela. Danette Michaela. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, wait a second. I didn't know that was your daughter. Yet. Oh, man. Oh. You've met her, haven't you? You know, I think so. Yeah. I don't know. Hmm. Yes, you had the pleasure. Isn't uh, she cute? You know what? She is, but you know, I like my women older. I can't handle that. Yet. <laughs> well, that's a good thing because she's off limits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she mentioned something about dating. No, she didn't because oh, she's really. not interested yet. Uh, she's not interested. <laughs> no. you, got, you got the gun? Oh, I have gun. Because <laughs> I, uh, I recall mentioning something about, I recall reading something about you have a licensed gun and the stress was really very stress you got to go shooting. Yes. Okay. Right. I'm, I'm from the Bronx. You from, oh, yes. you're from the Bronx. What part, what part of the Bronx are you from? I grew up in Co-op City. 
Oh boy, I had some family and some friends over there. Really? I recently was just um, up there. I was hanging around um, Brock Lebanon Hospital area. Okay. And things like that. But uh, I like Canada Nice, man. See, well, my fi- the rest of my family's from Manhattan. I have some from Brooklyn, all over the place, but I'm still a Bronx girl. Uh, you miss it? No. <laughs> <laughs> but you're a Bronx girl. I'm a Bronx girl. Okay, you know. <laughs> you know, you can uh, take the person out of New York, but you can't take the New York out of the person. It's okay. still going to always be there. So you, you are still the hood, is what you're saying? Never hood. <laughs> never, never, ever hood. Okay, that's very good. That's very good. Now, when you decided to uh, go for it, like I was saying, you, you could have gone to cooking, you could have gone these different ways. How did uh, you get around the business side of it? I th- you know, honestly, we already joked about the fact that I don't like to cook, so that was an easy decision. But it really is just, it's just who I am. It, it, was, a, it was almost a no-brainer. It was not a choice. It was deciding to walk in my power, and walk in what I'm meant to do. Mm -hmm. And that was really an interesting journey because most of my life I've been an entrepreneur. It's only those few times that I thought, oh, well, maybe it'll be easier to get a job. The stability, the insurance, you know those things that your mom keeps telling you, oh, well, maybe you should just get a job, it'd be easier, and I listened to her a couple of times. So I've been an entrepreneur pretty much my entire adult life. It's, it's, it's what I do. I, I actually can't imagine being something else. So you, because it's from what you were telling me with all of that, you're very good at change management. Yeah, that's okay. included. And, and pulling everything out. Now, what type of businesses do you help coach or you do do all types of different businesses? Well, my favorite type of business or client to have are those highly successful, high profile women. That is my, my favorite clientele. But I also have a group of clients who are in that parent and youth market because of my expertise in youth empowerment. So it's very good and refreshing to me to see that you're working and you have a variety of these women working together because a lot of times you find that women who are on a certain level don't get along. Because they're good in even the lower level, but then now when you achieve a certain level of success or power, the word money, status, they don't get along. She thinks she's cute. She thinks she's better than you. You see people arguing. All these different things. How is that working out for you? And that obviously is working out well. How did that transition to be, uh, you might say, working together? You, I love that question because the reality of my platform is really all about empowering those successful women to stop living this public persona of success when behind closed doors, they know that they have a private and explosive mess. So when I am working with them, it is all about showing them how to lead with unapologetic power so they can go from fierce to fortune. When you get right down to it, I'm a no-nonsense coach. I am a no-nonsense strategist. I already know that you're faking the funk. Okay. I already realize that you may be awesome. I think everyone is awesome. That's how God made us. But I can see the fake or the persona a mile away. So I am the kind of strategist that will call you on your mess. And so to do it nicely, I like to say that I'm giving you some tough love and cute shoes. (laughs) And then I'm able to sort of slide that information in that they need to hear and maybe some other coaches were afraid to say to them because they are successful, because they are people You know, they may be in politics. They may be executives at a Fortune 500 um, company. So people walk on eggshells around them because they don't want to offend them. They don't want to burn bridges. But truth is truth. Truth is truth. And they they say in comedy, the best comedy is the one that are telling the truth. Yeah, it's time for some truth. What, um, name a couple businesses out there you think that could use uh, your skills in terms of business coaching. 
Well, you know, people would like to say that any kind of business can use business coaching, but I primarily like to work with women who are already have arrived, if you will. They're already successful. They are, I, I love working with small business entrepreneurs. They tend to be my favorite because they're very focused and they're very um, interested in not just having a business that is successful, but a business that gives back. I am huge on giving back. What are some of the com what are some of the um, common traits that you see these business women have in order to be successful? Is it just being strong, willing to speak up, a certain type of attitude? So what are some personality traits or common things that actually you see these people do? I think one of the most important and the one that I'm really, really focusing on in 2014 is successful women are those who are willing to kick fear in the butt and get results. Cool. So that means they need to be focused. They need to be tenacious. They need to have a plan and really feel that plan. You know, feel it inside, not just in their head. There's a difference, you know between being able to be successful from what you think and being successful from what you feel. What do you see where, when people going across what they think and feel, and sometimes reality doesn't hit the nose on each one very well for them, how do you bring into focus for them to realize and say, you know what, this is what I feel, this is what I want, but you know what, in reality, you know, ma'am, this is not going to work for you. How do you bring that to them? Well, well, I start off with, I say, here comes some tough love and cute shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so they already know it's coming. But, you know, something that I say a lot, and actually it's the title of the first book I wrote, is Passion Won't Pay the Bills. You have a copy of that book? Of course I do. Ooh, Let's see where yeah. is it? Oh, just happens to be right here. Oh, gee. <laughs> awesome. Passion... Now, I must say, you, you know, you look much younger in this little bit. I do. Really? Well, thank you. So, uh, passion won't pay the bills. Yes. I tell you, well, so that's an interesting statement. Mm -hmm. I wish more people on TV would understand this. It says, uh, Miss Lynette M. Daniels, PhD, and it says, 10 mistakes that uh, close you serving programs and what you can do to thrive. Yes. Now, I'm going to ask you a question before we get into this book, but this is what I'm going to focus on at that. Charter schools with these ah. student programs. Okay. What do you think with that versus the money towards charter schools? And that um, they, a lot of them want more government funding because they're working, most of them are anyway. Mm -hmm. But they're working and you're getting much more success. You see where 100% of the kids are going to college and things like that. But then at the same time, now I'm, I'm all for education, public charter, what have you. But my feeling is that you use, a lot of parents that are sending their kids to the charter school is because they don't want the other mess of dealing with the other kids. Um, so they go to the charter schools, but in many of them, they can't afford all the other social structure programs that the public schools have. So you have an interesting dichotomy with it all. You do. What's the thoughts you of do. that? And of course, you throw in the whole homeschooling thing. Exactly. And you just have a big pot of stew. Mm -hmm. For me, at the end of the day, what I want is for you to receive equal education and to leave school knowing what they need to know to succeed as an adult. I don't want them to be able to pass from grade to grade because of a no child left behind policy. Mm -hmm. Now you have young people in the 12th grade who can't read. I don't think the no child, <laughs> that, that program never worked because of fun. I think one of the bigger issues was just funding with mm -hmm. that. And then, Okay, we speak about Northern Virginia. Some of those colleges in Fair, oh, excuse me, high schools in Fairfax and Loudoun County look like many community colleges. They're bigger than the community college yes. here. And then you go to the school where I went to Law Park, very nice school, but we didn't have the funding they had. Now we had some extra education, but I feel like you know they got wind tunnels. How come I can't have a wind tunnel? To learn and we play and do all these different things. Imagine how my mind would explode it if we had that same opportunity. To me, the No Child Left Behind was supposed to fix that. It just made it worse. It did. 
or you look at the fund the Virginia lottery is supposed to go to the schools. They only give it to the top performing schools. So if it keeps going to there, where's the money going to for the rural schools? Yeah. And that and that's exactly why I have a concern. I think that it's important that there be education out there that is high quality. So I do love the charter schools. I love what they call magnet schools, but it still doesn't address the schools that are in low, low income neighborhoods or that have a certain population of low income students because they don't have all of the extras and all of the frills, the, the building is falling apart. That's not fair. It, it, it's not appropriate, in my opinion, for us to have homeless people in the United States any more than it is appropriate for us to have certain students in public school receiving a lesser quality education than other students who are also in public school. I agree. In addition, this may be a minor issue for some, but I think it's a big issue. I'm tired of schools with just a number of public school, 362 or whatever. <laughs> but you know, I, I, and I say that for a reason. You always say, oh, you're not a, not a number, you're, you're a name, you're not a number. But what is that telling you? You can't even get a name. Mm -hmm. There's plenty, you know, we do, granted, we have tons of John Kennedy or King High School, whatever. The issue is, though, there's somebody in the community you can name the school after. Name it after a tree for all we care. But the issue, give it a name and start off something. Give somebody something to attach to. So when I see people say, yeah, I graduated from public school one. 47, whatever, I feel bad. <laughs> because it's like you don't have nothing to identify with their name, something that's standing. Now granted there's a lot of pride within those schools and communities, I understand that. But start off with the name and then you can work yourself there. So then that way, you're telling us that you're just not a number, you are a name. Yeah. And you know, New York is, is famous for that. I yeah. went to PS 178 and I went to IS 181. <laughs> so I understand what you mean. But let me tell you what's really interesting about that comment is that doesn't just relate to schools and, and names of, of things of that nature, but it also relates to names of businesses. I have a lot of clients who will come to me and one of the first things that I address is the name of their business, the name of their company. I think it's so funny that people pick names out of thin air. Mm -hmm. um, there's one client, a former client as a matter of fact, who she took all of her children's names, took the first letter, and she just kept scrambling it around until she came out with something that she could actually pronounce, because it still isn't a word, and this is what she named her company. So. Unless it's something extremely catchy that captures on like, you know, Google wasn't a word until like Exactly. So if it's not something that you have money in the marketing and catchy, you know, like an advertising or marketing firm that work with you. Exactly. I don't see the logic in doing that. Yeah, but they do it all the time. Name businesses after their kids, all kinds of things like that. So, you know, when you're talking about earlier you asked, what is it that successful women need in order to be successful. They really need to be able to also think things through. That was an impulsive decision. They didn't think through all, I mean, there's so many examples I can give about how you name things, but a successful business also has a successful name. It has a successful image. It has a successful brand. And so that's one of the things that I thought about when we were just talking about the names of school and I started thinking of all these clients that I had the challenge to change the name of their business. I fight with that a, bit, a lot with businesses overall, including especially with women. People get attached to a name, but I explained it to them, you have to think about the email, the name of your website. You don't want to name it something else, but then your website is totally different. <laughs> um, or you know dot whatever you can but most people don't associate dot and com you have a net or or but let it be something truly of that nature mm -hmm. um people just don't understand with that no uh, what do you feel about uh one of the comments i'll see here in the book and i saw on the page he asked me about following bright shiny objects Ooh, one of my favorite issues Bright, shiny objects and that easy button. Those are probably two of the things I harp on with my clients the most. 
Because the being sharper and better shot of skin is uh, shiny and bright does not necessarily make you shiny and bright. And it certainly doesn't get you to the bank. No. So the thing about those bright, shiny objects, especially now that we have the internet, everyone every day is coming up with some new tool or strategy or resource or web app or widget. I mean, there's plugins for everything. And so they have a good sales pitch, they have great sales pages to get you to believe that, oh, if you just do this, then you'll be successful in six weeks. <laughs> and we fall for it. You can't help but fall for it. I fell for it so many times, and that's the reason I talk about it often, because it happens, especially when you're a new entrepreneur and the, the bank account is getting low, you really start thinking about ways that you can speed this up. And that's, that's when those bright, shiny objects get even brighter and you start pressing that easy button thinking that, oh, if I buy this, I'm going to make some money really fast. <laughs> Not true. That is true. We're going to take a small break for a moment here. Yeah. We're, we're going to be back with Miss uh, Dr. I don't want to let you say the name because you say it pretty. Dr. Lynette Monte. You say it with so much excitement. That's why I like to <laughs> say it. We'll be right back, okay? So what kind of relationship are you looking for from your children? That's really the question that I think needs to be asked when we're thinking about do we want a boy first or do we want a girl first? Even as adults, we are still looking to our children to fill a void in our life. And depending upon what the void is, tends to determine whether you want a boy first or you want a girl first. So that's one of the things that I really would love to see us talk about is we realize that there is a difference going on in the home between raising a son and raising a daughter. But why is there a difference? Why do we put so much extra pressure on boys to perform, to lead the household, to be an example, to take care of the younger sibling, when boys are not as mature as girls, don't mature as early as girls, but yet we still put the pressure there. So I've seen some of you shaking yes and, and you know nodding yes. Talk to me about how you feel about that difference and why it's there. Look at it like that. It's all going in. It's going into your girls. It's going into your boys. The boys haven't quite figured out what to do with what's in there. Okay. The girls catch on quick and they figure, okay, I have some flour, I have some eggs, I have some sugar. I can put this all together and make some cookies. The boys just say, I have some flour, I have some eggs, I have some sugar, and it's in my way. That's it. That's what they see. So just keep pouring into them the information that you know they're going to need to be successful. And it will come out the other end. What's really interesting when we're talking about statistically, boys may mature slower, but by golly, when they get it, yes. they kick into high gear yes. and they are freaking amazing. It's a totally different place. It's a totally different kind of awesomeness when you have a boy who gets it, when he finds his purpose and he knows what he's supposed to be doing. It's like a rocket. Girls are steady, right? They're going along steady. So we see the progress. That boy will shoot right past her when he finally figures out what he's supposed to be doing, what is his purpose, what is his plan. So just keep pouring in and letting them figure some things out on their own. You can't fix everything. You can't prevent them from making mistakes. You cannot rescue them all the time. They have to learn from the choices that they have made. If you give them opportunities at a young age to start making choices and decisions, they'll figure it out soon. Because it's not fair. Once they reach a certain age, no matter what you taught them, whether you spanked them or you didn't spank them, whether you gave them chores or you didn't, whether they had allowance or they didn't have allowance, we have all these little rules about what we think should be. 
when every child is an individual. You have to look at that child for who they are, where they are, what they want to do, where they want to go, and you have to nurture that. So when it's over, they'll have in them what you planted. You can continue to water and fertilize, but the decision is theirs. You know, we wrote a book. My, my daughter and I actually wrote a book together called Success is a Decision. And it's a book for young people. And we did that because we wanted them to start thinking about their success, thinking about their future, not blaming everything on mom or dad. Well, you didn't, well, you treated her different. Let me, I, I need to give you this secret because it's something that just bugs me. Your children don't have to have the same thing. It is okay for you to go to the store and see something cute for one right. and bring it home and give it to them without buying something for the other. Oh, absolutely. If you don't start the foolishness, then you won't have the foolishness. The next time, it may be something really cool for the other child. If you have one pack of oatmeal and one pack of grits, then just give one grits and one oatmeal. <laughs> they don't have to have, everybody doesn't have to have a balloon from the birthday party. <laughs> there, weren't, there weren't enough balloons. Get over it. If we don't teach our young people that life isn't fair from day one, then we won't keep hearing them say, oh, my teacher's not fair. Oh, my boss isn't fair. Oh, my wife isn't fair. We're setting them up for fairness and failure. Mm -hmm. I like that. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is Stephen Sykes with Alive and Radio. We're back with Mr. Lovely. I don't think you say the name because it's pretty every time. <laughs> Dr. Lynette Monte. Dr. Lynette Monte. You didn't say it as exciting this time. Uh oh, sorry. <laughs> say it one more time. Dr. Lynette Monte. There you go. That's how we love it here and things like that. Now, we were talking about the um, shiny bright objects before and stuff like that. But you also mentioned the easy button. Yes. Okay. Why is everybody. I'll give you an example. People want to success without the hard work with that's it. Right. And again, that's where the easy button comes in yes. from. Why is that? Every, it's, 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 well, we can go all the way back to some, some biblical stories here. <laughs> on that one. So, so the bottom line is that people want something for nothing. Mm -hmm. They want more out than they put in. And that's not reality. And I'll tell you that, you know, this sort of goes back to some of the youth empowerment issues that I talk a lot about. We are setting our young people up for this type of an attitude as an adult. So now we have all of these adults who just want something for nothing. They want this wonderful hundred, six hundred thousand dollar a year business but they don't realize that they have to start somewhere and they have to be in the trenches. And there's this one um, scenario or, or story that I love to share. And so can I share it with please, you? Okay. Please. I used to always use the phrase work smarter, not harder. As a matter of fact, with my PhD in performance improvement, it's all about doing better and doing better with less and streamlining and all that. So I loved that saying. It used to be on my business card. And about two years into having my business, with that on my business card, I went to a conference. And this is the scenario that the person shared. And I thought, wow, that hit me like a ton of bricks. So we think about work smarter, not harder, sounds great. Well, if you're in a room, like this room that we're in, for example, and you decided that you wanted to leave this room, it would definitely be working harder if you physically tried to keep running into that brick wall until you could knock it down. Right. That would absolutely not make sense to anyone for you to try to work that hard to knock that brick wall down just so that you could leave this room. Well, working smarter means that you could go and get a sledgehammer 
You could go and get an axe. You could go and get something of that nature to try to get through that brick wall. Now, wouldn't that be working smarter? Yes. But is that going to get you out of this room in the best way? Yes, it probably sa is safer. What, by using a sledgehammer? Uh, well, yeah. Or a drill? or Right, versus running into it. Okay, so let me challenge you on this. Actually, the absolute best and safest and smartest way to leave the room would be to walk out the door. Right. No, I'm saying if the, if the door wasn't available. Well, I'm, your I'm room has a door. Right. Right? Yeah. Yes, it does. So, what I want people to understand from this little story that, that I learned and that changed my business is you have to work hard. You do want to learn to work smarter. But at the end of the day, you have to work right. Work hard, work smart, and work right. Exactly. And that is what will actually get them to that success place that they're dreaming of. And also, with working right, that means also including the moral aspect in your oh, work. Oh, I love that. Because a lot of people will feel like, okay, I'm just going to do it because it's right, but it's the, the moral thing. Because sometimes, and and uh, discussions with other people all the time. Sometimes the law, what they say you have to do, is not always the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And you have a moral aspect of it. I'd rather go down, and it's, not, it's, it's biblical as well, I'd rather go down to doing the right, the moral thing versus what is necessary the law says. Because mm -hmm. like it's making sure that you're safe. Like, I get teased all the time, y'all don't do this because it's weak or whatever. But at the end of the day, are you safe at home? Versus me wondering, am I going to get the phone call that you're happening, you, something happened, or you just forgot to call me back and let me know you got home safe. Mm -hmm. I'd rather work work smarter and work right by doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. So that goes a long way. Yeah. How, uh, when you started getting into the coaching of all of this and the business aspect, what did your mom say? Oh, well, my mom probably just said it's about time. Because <laughs> but she was asking you to do the other thing. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it's interesting because at some point she apologized to me because if you think about the different generations, she is almost 70 years old. Oh, so she's still with us. Yes, absolutely. Thank the Lord. That absolutely. Tell and so hi. I sure will. Okay. And so they were, they were raised to get a job. That's what they know. So for her, being an entrepreneur is a great idea, but it was so risky. But she saw how much I struggled every time I tried to go and do the job thing. I wasn't happy. Yes, I made money, but I make more money now in an hour than I made in a whole month, a whole week at my job. Mm. So it financially makes sense. So she's happy about that, but her seeing me happy is that the end of the world. Was because the biggest deal. You heard the phrase, if you really like what you do, you never want to do it. Yes. And you really do like yes. what you do. I do. I love it. What do you say to other young women who are trying to do the professional coaching, the uh, life coaching thing? Some are successful, some are not. Mm -hmm. What advice do you give to those young ladies? The advice that I give is to be you and do you. And I say it that way specifically because we talked earlier about that persona thing. <laughs> it's really easy to have on the right name clothes and to wear the brand name shoes and to carry the right purse. But if you are not walking your talk, if you are not liberating your fears, and that means you leading with that unapologetic power that we talked about, then your business is not going to succeed. I don't care what you know, I don't care how many letters you have behind your name, you absolutely have to stand on who you are, who God made you to be, what your purpose is here on this earth, and you have to be able to do it with boldness. People don't find out what, people don't find out or bother to listen what he had told you to be. I believe God told me, and I could be wrong, but I believe God told me I'm a helper and to be doer and things like that. And um, I try to be a networker. Uh, other people are, you know, teacher. Some people are more thoughtful. It just depends on what he has in store for you. 
And some people want to call it fate, some people want to say karma, some people want to call these different things. Let it be for whatever it is for you. But whatever it is, you need to follow it and, and go at it hard. And sometimes you may not see it. But it's the aspect of if you try it faithfully, you never know what you might get. Yeah. It may put you in another direction, but you got to go through these steps to be a better person. That's why you see so many people who are teaching, they, who are teachers now, but they had to go through these all these different steps in life because they were avoiding their calling. That's right. That's right. And I did it. I mean, we've all been there. Mm -hmm. So, but if you, but eventually, if you really want to have that successful business and be happy, because that for me is key. You can have a successful business and be absolutely miserable. Look at all these rich, wealthy people who are committing suicide. And we're thinking, you have all the money in the world. You can do anything you want, and you're so unhappy that you would commit suicide. So happiness is imperative to the success of your business and your life. It, it's, it, it goes together. And I see a lot of people trying to separate their personal from their business. Mm -hmm. And it's really not going to work. You are who you, you are. are. <laughs> and you need to be the best who you are that Versus you can be. who you are not. Yes. Because everybody want to be the next Kim Kardashian. Everybody want to be right. the next Beyonce. Whatever the case may be. Who's ever the hot person at the moment. Right. What do you see where, um, as a woman, as an entrepreneur, and we're seeing more and more women now taking that step to being an entrepreneur, we're in a different situation now in society, especially the last seven years. And some are, uh, and let me put it uh, a little bit differently. Some say they're saying it's a matrimony versus a patriotic uh, uh, form of view. But you have the issue of now more women are working, but then now more women are earning more. And now more women have jobs, whether they were earning more or not. And the men don't have the jobs. <laughs> you know, they're out there working or trying to find work or whatever the case may be. But now the women have, more women have jobs than men. Do you think that's a good thing or do you feel you can do it balance? Wow, now that's a that's a question to start some stuff. I see. Uh, yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> I, I look I got my belt. I'm ready to get I'm ready to tell I can uh, already see that one. I'm uh, swing and take names, but I know I'm going down this ship, I'm gonna take you with me. <laughs> okay, so for me, first and foremost, the bills need to be paid, okay? okay? The kids need shoes and the kids need to eat. Mm -hmm. So I don't really care where the money comes from. I want to make sure those kids are taken care of. But I am old-fashioned. I want you to open my door if you're a man. I want you to pay the check. I am not, and I repeat, I am not going to work and you're not working. What if it's not really, happening? What if there's an issue like he's out there? I'm not saying the lazy bum that's just sitting there. Okay, there. fair enough. I'm, okay. I'm talking about the guy. The, those guys ex neck for me. I'm talking about the guy who working hard, mm -hmm. trying to find a work, doing the job search and everything else. But then things are not working. But he's doing whatever side job whatever he can pick up. Okay. Now you may be working, but your car is still taken care of. He cook. He may clean you. He's doing the Mr. Mom thing, but he's still taking care of other things as well. He may not be able to pay the bills at the dinner, but he's taking care of other things. He's still treating you like the queen. I'm good with that. Okay. I'm good with that. Why more women are not, because of that's the situation with a lot of men these days, mm -hmm. uh, women are accepting of that. And I, I, yeah, I just don't get that. You know what? And, and I'll be totally honest with you. I, don't, I really have not found that women have a problem with it. Here's another example of a public persona. The man, in my experience personally, as well as the client that I have, it really is the man who has a problem with it. The man, men are still macho. They still want to be the head of the house. They still want to lead. But being the head of the so, house is not about the dollar. Uh, well, could you tell them that? <laughs> I mean, you, I realize that. I need you to tell them that. Let me, let me tell you. I don't know how many times, personally, I've asked a man when I first meet him, okay, do you have any concerns, any issues with 
a woman who has more education or a woman who makes more money than you do or any of that. Help yourself. Well, similar answer, but that wasn't what that wasn't the reality because it questioned their manhood. See, that I, was their that was their persona. See, I need you to have those friends, whether you earn more money or not, whether it's I, you're out there doing something. Either say I'm working, earning all the money in the world, but you decide to be at home. I want you to still be volunteer to do something in the community. I want you to. I just don't want you sitting there watching TV all day long watching Jerry Springer. <laughs> in the story, I need you to do something, whether it's bringing income, money, or not, because I want you to be have your sense of pride, independence that I'm making all the decisions. Because you could be making all the decisions in the world, but because you're not doing something, there's that level of thought that I'm doing something, I'm working. There's that communication is giving you some type of a life. All those different things that you have something to show for than being you have my dinner and they go and get back when I come home. Well, let me challenge you with a question or, or a conversation. Help yourself. We're here. So one of the other things that I find statistically outrageous is the scenario that you just painted where the woman is working, she, for whatever reason, and I agree with you, there are some amazing men out there who are in a bad situation. They were laid off, and it is really hard for anyone to find a job right now. So my hat goes off to them for stepping up and doing what they can, but I want them to make sure they're being supportive of whatever their wife is bringing to the table. But here's the thing, going to our scenario, those are the very same men, though, who are beating their wives. Not always, I'm going to give you an example. Just like how you say that's the public perception, that's the public perception of one way. That they, not all men are doing that. Well, not all anything. You know, that's one of the words that I tell people to take out of their vocabulary. The word all, the word never, the word always. I always use mostly, excuse me, I use the word mostly majority or overall. I, I have a hard time. There are a lot of men out there beating, but I can't say overall because nowadays there's too many women that's willing to fight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know you may get your butt taken a couple of times, but you're gonna wake up with a knife to your throat <laughs> or a gun to your head. It's true. So there's it, it's, it's no problem. And you you see a guy, you know, often comes to bed and see the guy laying in bed and the girl sitting there fighting, following her nails. He got my name in there one, two, three times. <laughs> okay, case closed. I mean, you know. Okay, so now what do you think about the demographics of your position and mine? Because I see the exact opposite. In the arena that, that my clients are in, the women who are high profile, um, they are in more of a situation where the husband is the abuser. Well, there, that is the case. Uh, I'm not going to say that's a situation that does not exist. That does. But also, sometimes in that situation, also um, looking on the other side of the coin, some women and some people want to say black women, but I don't want to say that because it, you'll see it in a lot of women. Mm -hmm. They bully the guy because to a point. Now, I'm not advocating what he did is right in justification. Right. But they bully to the guy, and it's like, dang, you don't got a job done yet? You ain't doing nothing. Your mama was right. You know, so they're constantly doing the poking and things like that. So they emotionally, mentally, and emotionally abusing you. And you're, and as a guy, you're trying to do all you can. It's not so much of your pride. It's, it's, a, it's an issue of you just want to do something so you can say you contributed. Right. It may not be to what you wanted, but it's your right as a human being, gender aside, human being to be to make something of yourself and contribute to the world. So when you're not able to do that, it's a stress. Be gone all the fact of who's male or female. So now when you got a woman adding nagging and nagging and nagging, you ain't doing this, then there's a problem. There's a lot of guys who do not like a woman in power. That's it's true. For that reason. Uh, because they take it to the head. You get mad Husband didn't come home at one time at night. He was out cheating. You may be on a cycle, whatever the case may be. And there are women, famously, who take that out on their job and everything goes to crap for that week mm -hmm. or whatever goes on. And somebody has to be the linchpin to make it happen. Right. 
So that's where that comes about. And also, I'm going to add another factor into this. You still have religion and business that factors in where a lot of people don't feel like women don't be, need to be civic uh, creatures, thus women don't need to be empowered. Yes. So that goes along with it too. So what's the solution? The solution is, is, immediate in my, is, is one, communication. And to say, stop the BS. I, it's not so much about men and Mars women from BS. It's just like, look, be darn it, you have emotions too. And everything. So is, and people are going to have a certain view because of how they are raised or how they're being brought up. Right now, we brought up hurt people hurt people. Absolutely. So we're in a society now that we're busy, too busy hurting each other because of what somebody else done versus sitting down and communicating, expressing these views, stop beating me down because of it. And to go on, people like to say the word judge. I say the judge is, you're supposed to judge. You, because every day I make a decision who I talk to, where I go, how I eat, all these things you're supposed to make a judgment call. What you're not supposed to do is condemn. And that's where we're getting in by and by and far, far from this world. And that goes back to what you asked earlier when you said, you know, since all of my clients are females, I have a couple of men in there, and they're mostly high profile, especially the whole cat fighting and, you know, do they get along? And But see, that's not always the case. So many of them will get along, do so many different things. That's the energy. That's the focus. That's why you're here. That's why you've been blessed here on this earth. That's why you're here with me. That's the energy I want people to see. Mm -hmm. And that is the difference. I don't. I don't. I won't have it. You know. Um, I told. I did a coaching call. My, it's called a Q and A, which means that all of my clients can come on the phone live, ask whatever business questions they have, and I answer them on the spot. You just go round robin. And I don't remember the question, but I remember explaining to them the importance of understanding that you cannot receive anything if your hands are closed so tightly around your own possessions. It's not, I mean, if you, I literally had them to look at their hand. And if you're holding so tightly onto your money and your stuff, then how can you possibly have a hand that is open and to able receive. to receive. That includes your mind, that includes your heart. Because at the end of the day, it's all stuff. Yeah. Because it's going to be, I tell people all the time, and I think you mentioned something it's similar to the book of the Greek, I forgot the uh, part of it from what I saw online. It's your journey. Mm -hmm. It's not so much at the beginning and the end. Mm -hmm. You want to finish strong, obviously, but you know, if you want to take me out, you're going to go without fighting. But, Either way, it's that journey, because I, I can't, a lot of things, I cannot tell you how it started, but I can tell you how all what happened during that journey mm -hmm. and things like that. So that's the most amazing thing yeah. to me. Yeah. You, you also write other books, so you have yes, another book, don't you? Yes, brand new. I think this book was probably just released maybe within the last six weeks. Oh my. Yep, haven't even done the launch yet. So huh, this can be the official launch moment I'm, with you. I'm better than the US uh, bestseller list. Yay, you, you okay. come, you come on my show, we're gonna make it happen. <laughs> Forget Oprah's, you know, favorite things. Who needs the New York Times this bestseller? This is your favorite thing moment, you know, right? This is my thing. You know, that's all right. You hear you hear it first on the live and radio with Mr. <laughs> Dr. Lynette Monte. Yeah. And See, we, you said it great. So say, I, I try to say it better than you have. <laughs> and we have a debut new book, and that book is? Ah, this book is called 21 Ways to Add $100,000 to Your Business. Woo! Now, how long it takes to get to the 21 day? <laughs> See, 21 Ways. 21 Ways to Add $100,000 to Your Business. Yes. And what I love about this book is it literally has 21 different ways to make a hundred thousand dollars in a year and i give you specific calculations on how you can do that so if there's 21 ways then you can actually take one and work that plan or you can mix and match them and get there faster or make more is one of the ways uh, number two or number three asks uh, you for a business loan? And, <laughs> no. Uh, I, I, you know, Definitely not. <laughs> I, I thought that was one of the 21 ways. I'm sorry. Not a problem. How much, oh, by the way, how much, uh, do, before we get to you, how much is this book? This, the Passion Won't Pay the Bills book is $12.95. Okay. 
that's a phrase my grandmother could probably tell. I can tell you that book for right now. But <laughs> and then this book is and that book is seven ninety five. Seven ninety five, and yes. we can get these books located at. They can get them on my website, which is lynettemonte.com. dot dot com and, and L I N E T T E M O N T A E. Yes. Dot com. Hey, I paid attention. <laughs> I didn't get the Honda. It wasn't fortunate to get a home school, but I paid attention. <laughs> Shout out to Laura Park. Okay. Now, uh, one of the things um, you have in your book, uh, tell us a little bit more about 21 Ways. Like, what's number two? Well, I don't know them in order, so tell me what number two is, and I'll tell you all about it. Okay. Number two says, uh, let me see my fingers. This is what I have in the video courses. Oh, video courses. One of the things that I really, really strive to do with my clients is to teach them how to have a successful business offline and online because it's all about multiple streams of income. That's why I wrote this book. You can be the best speaker in the world. You can be the best coach in the world, but you're working hours for dollars. That means that when the hours in the day run out, you can't possibly make any more money because the hours are gone. So the key is to start adding in products and programs and opportunities for your target market to learn from you and to buy from you. You create it one time and it's continu it continues to be available to them. So in video courses, one of the ways that they can use that is by actually creating a video training. It could be a training that you sit and do maybe a five part series all at one time and then package it for download on their website. Or it could be a club or a membership where you do a video every single month and people are paying you every month like the DVD club, but they're paying you to be able to download or have access to your new training every single month. Now, let me ask you a question business wise. What is the, what's the best way of getting this? Okay, I could go in here and buy it. And then buy it. But I could go to YouTube University and do it. The same, the same thing. What is the argument for that versus this? When you say put a video and sell it versus something online, it's going to be the same answer no matter what the business or the question is. People are not buying your information because we can Google information. They're buying you, they're buying your perspective on that information. Okay. Just like your radio show. Yes, there's a there's a million radio shows out there. Yes, it is. Right? Yes, it is. But they come and they listen to your show all the time because they love your feistiness, they love your <laughs> honesty. They love the fact that you are keeping it real, so they are actually buying you. That's the difference. Everyone knows something that someone else doesn't know. There really isn't new information under the sun, though, right? You could teach on how to start a radio show, but the information you share with them may be similar to what someone else would say, but you're going to say it differently. You're going to share it with your enthusiasm and your guster that they're not getting from someone else. You may know some tools and some tips and some strategies to get it done faster or better or easier that some other people don't share. So it really is all about you. No matter what your business is, yes, there is a hundred more businesses just like yours that are teaching the same information, but the one thing that none of them have is you. Yeah, that's true. I'm not going to sit here and deny it. <laughs> and okay, thank you. We're going to speak into existence and positive, positive <laughs> vibes and all of this. Now, is this, these are the only two books you have right now. Those are the only two that okay. I have right now. Now, you also go around the world speaking. I do. Now, where have you, what's some of the favorite places you spoke at? You got spoken at, excuse me. Right now, top on my list is the two weeks that I spent in Houston. Hmm. I spent two weeks in Houston, actually in June of this year, and while I was there for that two weeks, I spoke ten different times. Hmm. And that was just, Houston is a beautiful place, the people were so warm it's and inviting, grown. and oh, it's just amazing, it's huge. Yeah, that's the new, new Mecca, you had, uh, Seattle was growing one time, then you had, uh, I don't know, 
Charlotte, Georgia, and I don't know, mm-hmm. Houston the last few years. Mm-hmm. People are flying out to Houston. Yes, Houston is really hot. So that's right now, that is still top on my favorite list. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, is being here with you. I thank you so very <laughs> much. You know, I greatly appreciate that. Um, you had uh, on your uh, website, you mentioned about uh, a... Uh, Lord Jesus, I forgot the name. But you you mentioned about uh, taking your business coaching and uh, setting it up as a package or as a group Mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. How are people able to get part of that? And then that's another one of the 21 ways Mm -hmm. is actually creating packages. Because as we talked about a moment ago, if you're coaching one-on-one all the time, then you're going to run out of time. And that means that I won't be able to serve as many people and help as many people with their business if I run out of time. So I encourage my clients to create coaching packages just like I have coaching packages. Now the interesting thing about a coaching package is it's not about how much time you spend with a person. It is actually about the result that you get from that relationship. So maybe it's a three month coaching package. You're not offering it as you get to spend an hour with me once a month for three months because no one really wants to buy time. What they want to buy is a result. What are they going to gain? How is their life or their business going to be different from having spent that money, which is actually an investment. It is not a spending. And how, are they, how is their business going to be different? How is their life going to be different? What is going to be the benefit to them from that coaching package? So if anyone wants my coaching packages, they can always go to LynetteMonte.com, and I have several options and group coaching programs and things like that. I even have some self-study programs wow. for some of the entrepreneurs who aren't quite ready for coaching. They haven't. Um, they don't have enough clients or you know their financial stability is not yet ready to <laughs> invest in my services personally. But you can get that loan since you're a couple <laughs> more, more so, um, so there are lots of options that I have available for working with me and they're the same kinds of options that I help my clients create. Ms. Okay. Lynette Monte. Yes, sir. You are awesome. Thank you. I want to thank you very much, not just on behalf of Enliven Radio, but also Legacy Internet Radio as a company. You're awesome. I thank you so very much for spending time. With well, thank you so much for having yeah, me. No problem. And so people can contact you, they can contact you through the website. Yes. Do you have a contact us page or email you want to give out? Or? Well, the easiest thing to do is to focus on LynetteMonte.com. I have all kinds of buttons there to Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Oh, my. Any place you want to connect with me, it's listed on my website. Thank and you know what? What? Really cool. I also have a free gift on my website. Free gift? Oh, a free gift. What's the free gift? The free gift is a program called Kick Your Comfort Zone Goodbye. Ooh. Ooh, that's interesting. <laughs> I will not get you out of here without a couple of quick questions Uh-oh. because we won't hit you off with a few of them. You already said your favorite place is my favorite place is Northern Virginia Northern to Virginia. live. Okay. Yes. Favorite foods. My favorite food is pizza or pasta, Italian all the way. What's two th- major things you want women to learn before getting out here in the world? I want women to learn to liberate their fears and to walk their talk. Liberate, liberate their fears. Mm-hmm. Fierce. Yes. Liberate their fears. Yes. Walk their walk. walk their talk. Walk their talk. Okay. Uh, now that you we, we got into a little bit of education, uh, the political of health care. Oh wow, now that's a good one. I feel the same way about health care as I feel about education. I think it's absolutely absurd for us to live in the United States of America and to be sick and dying and not be able to afford to go to the doctor and to buy medication. It's it's just, that's another show. <laughs> that's another show for sure. I mean, that's definitely not a problem. <laughs> I thank you very much, so much for everything. And you're always a friend of the program and I'm, I'm waiting for my copies. You can have those. I can I have will these. Sign them you want to sign you. these for me? Absolutely. I don't wish somebody else would sign sign the book for me too, <laughs> but I don't know. You have to send me a picture or a sign so I can put you on the wall here. Okay. And things like that. 
and uh, welcome to the Bat Cave. Uh, they call it the Den, but I just want to use the Bat Cave. I like the Bat Cave. Thank you. I, I'm going <laughs> to make sure you say that one more time for Bonnie. But uh, <laughs> you're a blessing. Uh, you're always welcome. Whenever you have anything going on, please do let us know. Thank you so, so much. So we can get you out there and the word out there. And um, hopefully that, uh, you know, when people get out there and see this video and see you and the energy and all the things that you're doing, uh, bless us with. Uh, they can get forward in life and you probably save somebody's life today. Thank you so much. You have a blessed one and thank you for coming to the live video. Thank you. Everybody, we'll see you with the next video soon and y'all have a blessed one and be good to each other. Bye bye. to another episode of Stop the Madness, One Size Fits All Does Not Get Big Business Results. Well, today we are talking about my top 10 lies that I hear being told, that I hear being shared across social media that I've been told, and unfortunately I passed on to my clients because I didn't know any better. Well, I want to stop the madness. Today is lie number six. And lie number six says, Social media is all about being social. Well, that's only half true. And of course, we teach our children that a half truth is still a lie. So let me tell you the problem with that statement. When you hear that social media is all about being social, if you're a business owner, it leaves you confused as to how you can use social media to get customers, contracts, and cash. Well, I want to share with you what I learned in the midst of that confusion for myself, and hopefully this will help you too. Now, let me warn you, I teach a 60-minute teleseminar on this topic, so I'm going to try to boil this down in just a five-minute quickie. Here's the formula that I've come up with. It's called P-A-D, and that stands for Participate automate and delegate. Now for participate, that's all about what you need to do personally on social media. Things like retweeting, things like liking people's comments, um, sharing comments of your own, starting conversations, connecting with other people who have business tips, tools, and resources that you enjoy, and then connecting people that you know with others. That's the participate part. When you spend your time and energy in the participate area, it can really turn into hours and hours and hours on social media without having time to share your business. So that's where the automate comes in. So let me tell you, social media is two words. The social part is all about you participating, but don't forget the word media. Media is what is going to allow you to talk about your business, to talk about your products and services, and to get clients. But in the media, you still have rules and you still need to plan and be strategic. It's just like creating a business plan or creating a marketing plan. You need to create a social media plan. So this is where automate comes in and this is where you literally have specific things that you are going to promote and that you are going to share on social media that don't directly sell your product all the time, but that lead up to people being interested in what you have to share. And then to really ramp up your time savings, you want to delegate. There's so much about social media, the media part of social media, that doesn't have to be done in real time and doesn't have to be done by you. So P-A-D is participate, automate, and delegate. Once I figured that out, I was happy, but 
I still had a problem. It was taking way too much time. So I created a social media marketing success program, but more specifically, I created a tool that will allow you to automate and to delegate. It will allow you to plan your social media, the media part of being social, so that you can get your business out there in a big way. If you'd like more information about PAD, please check out bigbusinessresults.com forward slash social media. But before I go, I want to remind you, you can be social and share information about your business to get customers. So long for now, I'll be looking for you on the very next video. And remember, it's time to stop looking at the size of your business and start questioning the size of your results.